Today, I'm gonna to share with you three progressively more disturbing stories, and at the end of each of them, I'm gonna share with you the picture or video that is famously associated with them. But before I get into today's stories, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right channel because that's all I do and I upload three, four, even five times every week. So if that's of interest to you, please offer the like button a flimsy plastic outdoor chair, and then once they sit down, kick one of the legs out from under them. Also, please subscribe to this channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of my weekly uploads. All right, let's get into today's stories. World War II, the Soviet Union began investing heavily into nuclear power, and by 1977, the V.I. Lenin nuclear power station located in Chernobyl, Ukraine, was finally operational. The station itself was comprised of four reactors that were each labeled 1, 2, 3, and 4. On April 25, 1986, a group of very sleep-deprived plant workers began running a series of routine tests on nuclear reactor number 4. They were trying to see if the reactor could still be cooled even in the event of a complete power loss. But during the test, perhaps because they were sleep-deprived and just didn't feel like doing it, they started cutting corners and violated a number of safety protocols that led to several surges of power inside of the reactor. This led to a chain reaction of explosions within reactor number four that culminated in a massive explosion that blew the lid off the building, exposing the reactor's core. It would take the Soviets 10 days to finally stop the fire that was raging inside of this exposed core, which meant for those 10 days, radiation on an unprecedented level was spewed into the environment by this fire. But even after the fire was controlled, you have all this radioactive material that needs to be properly disposed of. And so the Soviets started by using robots to go up and pick up these materials and dispose of them, but the robots were breaking down from the high levels of radiation. And so naturally the Soviets sent in groups of men to go pick up the material and dozens of people died from radiation sickness. A few months after the explosion, the first steel sarcophagus was built around reactor number four to try to contain some of that radiation. But even with that protection, it's estimated that the area around Chernobyl will not be habitable for another 20,000 years. So as a result, the Soviet Union created what they call an exclusion zone, which is 19 miles all around Chernobyl that no one can go inside of. And so nature's kind of reclaimed this area that used to be a fairly bustling metropolis. One year after the disaster, Ukrainian containment crews finally broke into the steam corridor that was located underneath the molten remains of reactor number four. And as soon as they stepped in, their radiation readers spiked all the way to the top. And so they know that whatever's at the the other end of this L-shaped hallway is something they did not want to get close to. And so they put a camera on a chair with wheels and they pushed it down the hall to where it finally broke that corner and had a clear line of sight to the other end. And using a timer on the camera, they were able to take a picture of one of the single most dangerous things in the entire world. It became known as the elephant's foot. It was a molten pile of nuclear fuel and melted metal and sand and concrete that had all kind of converged and seeped through a pipe meant for steam and found its way into the basement. It was and still is emitting the equivalent level of radiation of four and a half million chest x-rays every hour. Today, if you were to stand in front of the elephant's foot without proper equipment for 30 seconds, your cells would start to hemorrhage and you would become viciously ill and you could even die. At two minutes of exposure, you're definitely going to die, but not right away. You have 48 hours and there's nothing you can do to stop it. You are 100% going to die. On October 31st, 2013, four mechanics were performing routine maintenance on a wind turbine in the Netherlands. In the early afternoon, all four of them are standing on top of the turbine itself, two on one end and two on the other, and a small fire breaks out inside of the housing of the turbine, right near where you would go back into the housing. 
Now it's unclear what caused the fire, but it's speculated that it was caused by a short circuit. The two engineers on this side of the turbine were able to jump over the fire, land in the stairwell and run their way down to safety. The other two on this side had a bad angle and could not make the jump. And so they had to wait until rescue workers showed up to put the fire out. But wind turbines are usually in areas that are very far away from society because they're huge and they're kind of eyesores. And so the response time was not good. The fire department did not show up very quickly. And by the time they got to the wind turbine, that little fire had gotten much, much bigger and had creeped up onto the platform that they are on. And then when the fire department actually started performing their job, the fire had spread well down the stairwell. And so it was very difficult and took a very long time to make their way up using the stairs. And the crane on the truck itself did not extend high enough to reach them either. The two trapped mechanics are watching this in real time. They're looking down and they can see the fire department is not gonna be able to reach us in time because the fire is now spreading and getting bigger and bigger and they're being pushed to the very edge of this wind turbine with an 80 meter fall to the ground. As the fire inched closer and closer and closer to them, the men must have realized that they have to make a decision here. They can either sit here and wait and hope for some miracle that perhaps a helicopter shows up and scoops them up or some other mechanism of rescue is able to occur, or they try to make a run for it through the flames on the top of the turbine into the stairwell and just hope that the fire in the stairwell is not as severe and that maybe they can run through it and make it out the other side. Or the final option is to jump off the side and hope you survive the fall. And so as the fire continued to grow and get closer and closer to them, the men embrace one last time, and then one of them makes a run for it through the flames into the stairwell. His charred body would be found right at the landing of the stairs. He did not make it very far. He really had no hope. The last remaining mechanic is standing there wondering what he should do. He's probably looking down in hopes that he's gonna see his friend who just ran in there emerge at the bottom on the ground safe but he doesn't. And after a considerable amount of time and the fire is getting closer and closer, he knows his friend didn't make it and probably not wanting to suffer the fate that his friend did, he jumps. This is the picture of the two mechanics embracing for that final time. I'm sure at the time of this picture, they were aware that almost certainly they were not going to get out of this alive. They were 19 and 21 years old. In 2013, Philip Chisholm was a 14-year-old high school student going to school in Danvers, Massachusetts. He lived at home with his single mother. Classmates described Chisholm as being quiet, a bit of a loner. He was a great student, and he was the leading scorer of his soccer team. On October 22nd, 2013, Chisholm missed soccer practice in the afternoon and then missed a team dinner that night, at which point his teammates tried calling and texting him. He didn't get back to them, so they got in touch with his mother. She tried reaching out to him to no avail, and so she contacted the police and said, my son is missing. On the same night that Chisholm is reported missing, one of his teachers, 24 year old Colleen Ritzer doesn't come home from work. Her family and her friends try reaching out to her, texting her, calling her, no response. So they too go to the police and they report her missing as well. The police were already looking for Chisholm. So when they hear one of his teachers is also missing, they assume they must be linked. And so they go to the high school, even though it's well after hours, to see if maybe there's some clues there. They search the high school and Chisholm is not there and neither is Miss Ritzer. But when they're looking in the girl's restroom that was right next to Miss Ritzer's classroom, they find a small splash of blood. Even though at the time they had no way of knowing if this blood was connected to Chisholm or Miss Ritzer, they decided they would pull all the security footage for the past 24 hours that was looking in the direction of this bathroom. And they make a startling discovery starting at the 2.54 p.m. mark on October 22nd, the day they went missing. This is Miss Ritzer walking down the hall towards the bathroom that had blood in it. This is Chisholm following Miss Ritzer into the hall. He's looking hesitant. He doesn't really know what he's gonna do. He's thinking about following her. And at some point he says, you know what? I am gonna do this. He goes back into the classroom re-emerges with his hood on and walks down the hall towards the bathroom where Miss Ritzer is. This is Chisholm entering the girl's bathroom with surgical gloves on. 11 minutes later, Chisholm would leave the bathroom. Miss Ritzer would still be inside. Chisholm would leave school property. He would run outside. He would get a big recycling bin and then he would wheel that back into the school and then he would go back into the bathroom with the recycling bin. 
At 3.21 p.m., 26 minutes after Chisholm had first entered the girls' bathroom after Miss Ritzer, he re-emerges now wearing a full face mask. He doesn't have a sweatshirt on anymore. And he's pulling along this recycling bin that looks noticeably heavier than when he brought it in. And that's because Miss Ritzer's body is now stuffed inside of it. Police were able to locate Miss Ritzer's body using the surveillance cameras on the outside of the school. They just watched what he did with the recycling bin and he didn't bring it very far away from the school. Police were able to quickly track Chisholm down and arrest him because as soon as he was done attacking Miss Ritzer, he used her credit card to go to a movie theater in town and watched a movie. So he's on security cameras watching the movie and the police were tracking her credit cards because they noticed they were stolen and they saw that he had swiped the card at this movie theater. So he gets arrested and he's given a life sentence. Here's the footage of Chisholm leaving the girl's bathroom with Miss Ritzer's body inside of that recycling bin. His motives remain unclear, but he claims she used what he called a trigger word that really upset him. So that's gonna do it guys. I hope you enjoyed today's stories. Let me know in the comments what you thought and I will pin the best comment at the top of the comment section. If you haven't done this already, please offer the like button a flimsy plastic outdoor chair. And as soon as they sit down, kick one of the legs out from under them. Also, please subscribe to this channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of my weekly uploads. If you wanna get in touch with me, you can direct message me on Instagram or on Twitter. My username on both platforms is the same. It's johnballin416. I also have a ton of content over on TikTok where my username is Mr. Ballin. If you have a story suggestion, please submit it to our subreddit. It's just called Mr. Ballin. It's linked in the description below. I check that every day. If I intentionally use your story suggestion, I will credit you. So whether I see you on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, Reddit, YouTube, some combination, just know that I really appreciate your support. And until next time, guys, that's going to do it. See ya.